Okay, so in this video, we're going to take a look at creating virtual machines. Now, I've already got a virtual machine called 2K8R2-1, something I'd created previously. I'm going to go ahead and create a new one. So basically, we're going to need to provide the definition of the hardware we want to declare for the virtual machine, how much virtual memory we're going to provide for it, that is, number of CPUs, disks, network cards, and so on and so forth. And they can have USB devices attached to them, serial and parallel port devices attached to them, or using direct path, we can even configure them to access IO cards in the host. So I'm just going to right click on my host here and say I want to create a new virtual machine. There's a couple of places in the interface you can do it, but this is the closest one. And it asked me whether I want to do typical or custom. You can see under typical, it wants to know where we're going to put it, what it's going to be running, and what network we're going to attach it to, and whether we want a disk. So that's pretty simple. Let's go ahead and start with that. So I'm just going to click next, and I'm going to call this W2K8R2-2. Now it lists my VMFS data stores. There's only two options for storing VMware virtual machines, an ESXi server, either on a VMFS data store, either locally or presented remotely through Fiber Channel or iSCSI, or over NFS. And in the event that you're using NFS, it's actually not the VMFS file system. It'll be a Linux, Unix file system, or whatever file system used by your NFS. Maybe a waffle file system on a NetApp file or something like that. So in this case, you can say I've only got the one data store created for now. In other videos, I'm going to create more. But for now, I've got data store one. So I'm just going to pick that and specify the OS that I'm planning to use in it. It's a very good idea to provide the correct options here so that it makes the right recommendations for you in terms of hardware sizing and also that the tools and everything will function the way they're supposed to, will send the right commands and all those things, right? So definitely a good idea to choose the right option here. But you may run into a situation where you don't have the right options here. We've got effectively just about every version of a Microsoft product ever made here, or a Microsoft operating system anyway. As you can see, we've got Windows Server 2012 all the way down to MS-DOS. And if we take a look at Linux, we have quite a few flavors of Linux listed here. But in case your favorite distribution, or if you've created your own distribution, is not listed here, then you can potentially use one of the generic options, which is mostly based on the particular Linux kernel that you're using, and whether it's 64-bit or 32-bit or not. So give that a try, or you can try for the really generic options, but you're probably going to find that performance is not that great, or that some other weird behavior or something may pop up. Hard to know. If you have a Mac device that's compatible, you can install ESXi on it, and then you can actually host Mac OS inside of it. So the licensing says you've got to be running on Apple hardware, and I believe it actually does check for the Apple security chip or whatever it is that Apple uses to validate that you're running on Apple hardware. We have to run the x86, x64 version of Solaris, and that's not the same thing as the Spark version of Solaris. We're going to need to make sure that we keep that in mind. We're not emulating, we're simply virtualizing hardware. The way that performance can be obtained is by virtualizing like hardware onto like hardware. And there's no real translation or anything involved. So you can see that we have both Oracle Solaris or Sun Solaris, no real difference, but just whatever version you're using. SCO Open Server and Unixware. We have Ecom Station, which is a community version of OS2 effectively, and Other, which probably not going to get you too far. Now, the most important thing really is to make sure we pick the right OS and then make sure that the VMware Tools package is actually available and installed for that virtual machine OS. Now, this is very easy on any of the well-supported versions of the guest operating systems and basically pops up like a disk, but this could be slightly more difficult on some of these more exotic systems. So I'm just going to say it's server 2008R264 and click Next. And now it wants to know how many network interfaces I want to have. So if I click 2, for example, you can see that I can attach them to whichever virtual machine port groups I have. I removed my corporate visitor center port group that I'd created earlier, but if I still had it, it would be listed here. If we're actually attaching the virtual machine to the same network, there's really no reason to have two virtual NICs. We can have multiple physical NICs associated with the switch for redundancy and performance, but we don't need to handle that inside the virtual machine itself. That's all transparent. So I'm just going to say I need one NIC, and it's going to be connected to my VM network port group. And if we look over to adapter, you'll see that we can choose the network adapter type. We're going to discuss this more in the performance videos, but typically the VMX Net 3 is going to provide the best performance. But for example, you can't do a network boot from it. So you can't install the operating system through Pixie Boot and something like Windows Deployment Services or Linux Kickstart or something like that without providing media anyway locally. So that might not be a big deal. 
But the E1000 is an Intel E1000 representation, and that's very, very widely supported, and lots of operating systems have drivers for it. And depending on what I had chosen as the operating system I was going to use, then it might have actually even said, you know, something different, like AMD PCNet, for example. So I'm just going to leave that and click Next. And then you can see it's going to place the disk where I told it to. And we can specify the size of disk that I want. So in this case, 40 gigs is enough, but I don't actually have 40 gigs on my data store to provide it. I don't think it's really ever going to get that big, but I'm probably going to extend this data store later. Maybe I'm going to add some sand volumes or something to it. So I think what I want to do is I want to tell the virtual machine it's got 40 gigs, but I don't have 40 gigs to give it. So I'm going to tell it to use thin provisioning, in which case it's going to start, well, zero. And then as I start installing the operating system and doing stuff, the file is going to get bigger. Eventually, I might exceed my current free space, which is 20.5 gigs. And if I do that, well, I'm going to have problems, not only for this VM, but everybody else who expected to get space on that data store, or at least everybody who is running in thin provisioning mode and didn't already have their space allocated to them. That's a decision you're going to have to make. I like using thin provisioning because I do a lot of testing, I do a lot of development, and I'm not worried really about the production impact. But thick provisioning is certainly better. Now you'll see we've got two types of thick provisioning. One's called lazy zeroed and one's called eager zeroed. So if the primary difference between a thin and a thick disk is that a thick disk is full of the space that we've allocated to it, it goes and writes zeros into that file. So that can either be done in a while you wait type manner. If you choose eager zeroing, you're going to sit here while it creates 40 gigs of zeros. Or you can do lazy zeroed where it will do it in the background and eventually you'll get up to your full file space. Your storage may actually provide a hardware assisted zeroing if it has what's called VAAI, and we'll talk about that more in the storage videos. Press enter to go next, and it says, wait a second, are you sure you really want to do this? And say OK. And there's a little checkbox down here. It says, edit the virtual machine settings before completion. I'm going to just leave that off and click finish. At that point, effectively, I could boot it and present it with whatever media I'm going to use for doing my installation, and it works just like a PC. Right click, I've got the option to power it on. And then while it's powering on, I'll quickly open the console for it. It looks very familiar. It's even trying to do a network boot right now off my Intel E1000 network adapter that we've presented it with. Now, in this case, I don't have anywhere for it to boot off of that Intel E1000 network adapter. So what we're going to need to do is present it with some operating system media to install from. So since I don't have Pixie Boot available on this network, as we can see, it comes up with an operating system not found. So theoretically, I could mount a CD DVD media from here and actually have it connect to the drive on the client where I'm running the vSphere client, an ISO image sitting on the local disk of the client as well. We could connect to a host device, so the actual physical drive inside the host, or to an ISO on a data store. Now, all of these other options have the potential to cause problems for you if you expect things like vMotion and so on to work. What I always do is take a data store somewhere and upload my ISOs to it in a location that's available, a data store that's actually shared across multiple hosts. This all becomes more important when we get into clustering later. What happens is every time you try to reboot, it resets the mappings for your media. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into VM menu. I'm going to click edit settings. And from there, I'm going to go to the CD DVD drive. And I'm going to click data store ISO file. I'm going to browse and find the ISO that I want. So in this case, I've got a folder called ISO sitting on my data store. We can see that we have the new folder that's been created for our VM. Go ahead and pick up my Windows 2008 media. Say to connect it when I power on. And then when I reset this virtual machine using the icons on the toolbar, or if I go to VM and I do you know, a power reset or something along those lines, then it's going to boot with that media automatically when it goes to start. And this time I boot straight into the Windows installation. So that's a pretty typical installation of Windows. I'm not going to video the whole thing, but effectively the most important part is to then format the drives and so on. One of the potential problems that you could get into is that the drivers might not be available for whatever your storage adapter is. Now, again, VMware is going to recommend that you use a storage adapter that's well supported by the OS you told it you were going to use. But if that driver is not available as part of that OS, you may need to provide it during the boot process. For example, running Windows XP from one of the supported SCSI adapters in VMware requires us to present the driver on a floppy disk to the virtual machine. So you can also mount an image file so we can use a floppy image that has that driver on it and then present it to that VM. 
But since I'm running quite a modern OS here and I've done exactly what it recommended to do, I'm not going to have any driver problems. And I'm just going to go ahead and install it. Now you might notice that the video inside this virtual machine is rather choppy. Now I'm actually going through multiple layers of virtualization, so that will contribute as well. But once we get VMware tools installed, then we're going to have a better video driver and potentially faster network and storage drivers available as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and pick a standard installation R2. You can see that I have that 40 gig thin provision disk that I set up in the VM. That's what the operating system sees. If I go into drive options, I could format it and things like that. You'll see I can load a driver here, but it doesn't need to be on a floppy disk the way it needs to for Windows XP. But typically it's just going to see the disks that you're using because you use the right storage adapter. So we'll talk more about that in the next video. And then from there, it's the standard installation of Windows. In the later videos, we're going to take a look at what happens to a virtual machine afterwards. And we'll go in and look at the hardware and so on before we've installed VMware tools and after we've installed VMware tools. And we'll talk a little bit more about why it's extremely important that VMware tools gets installed and maintained in all of your virtual machines.